And I've asked a very special guest to introduce the film. The reason, um, and it was so wonderful, I was talk we were talking to Mariel prior to coming here, Mariel Hemingway, and asked her to be involved in this film. And she very graciously agreed to come out and do an introduction because bottom line is she wants, as only Mariel Hemingway can say, she wants the film to be all about the filmmakers. So she wants the filmmakers to enjoy the Q&A afterwards because it really is their film. And she really didn't know her grandfather. He passed away before she was born. But she has agreed to come out and say hello and welcome you to this very special film about a very special friendship between her grandfather and Gary Cooper. Please welcome the incredible Academy Award nominated Mariel Hemingway. Except that my grandfather, Ernest Hemingway, is indeed one of the people that this film is about. Um, what's incredible about this film is this incredible friendship that Gary Cooper and my grandfather had, which was actually lore for me growing up. It was kind of like this incredible thing. We saw pictures of uh, Gary Cooper and my grandfather, you know, in the bar of my family home, which... If you saw the other film, you'd understand why that's actually funny. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> this is, um, what's so amazing is it, it was a time where, you know, these were two very, very different, or seemingly very, very different men who came together. My grandfather, kind of the man's man, and then there was Gary Cooper, who was a dapper and wonderful actor in Hollywood, and they, did, they were sort of an odd couple. So I think it's a beautiful... You know, it's a beautiful friendship, and I think you will truly, truly enjoy it. I was going to tell you a story about Cooper and Hemingway, and I, I don't know it that well, so I might get it slightly wrong. And if I screw it up, just laugh anyway, because I'm an actor, and I get very upset if you don't laugh. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so Gary Cooper used to go to a gas station, like in the desert somewhere, or it was in California. Anyway, he would pay with a check. And nobody took checks. I mean, nobody would take your check now, right? <laughs> Especially at a gas station. But they took his check because he was Gary Cooper. He was this famous actor. So he would give them a check. And my grandfather, a couple times, went to the gas station with him and saw that he gave him a check. So my grandfather, Ernest Hemingway, the very famous and fabulous Ernest Hemingway, went to the gas station on his own one day and tried to give them a check. And they said, we don't know who you are. <laughs> We can't take your check. So I just want you to know that Gary Cooper was much more famous than my grandfather. <laughs> and that is the end of my story. <laughs> Enjoy the story. Very happy day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Do stick around for the Q&A with Richard Zampella and John Mulholland. We're going to have a great conversation after the film. And enjoy Cooper and Hemingway, The True Gen. Richard and John, and um, I'll fire the first question, uh, and I'm not sure which one of you this one's for, actually. Uh, where did this project come from, and how long did it take you to research everything that we saw in the film? It really started in the 1980s when I was with the Arts Network. But after getting it approved, the man who approved it left, and the woman who took over scotched all of everything he had approved, so it was gone. So I put it aside in the late 90s and started looking into it then and began re-researching it. And the research took a decade. It was, uh, we uh, started out uh, with uh, 900 hours of footage. Uh, that 900 hours of footage uh, ended up with the uh, two and a half hours that you saw this evening. So uh, I think we refer to it as a labor of love. Uh, it was a tremendously uh, challenging uh, prospect to, to get it down to something that was manageable. It was beautifully, beautifully woven together, uh, the two stories and their, how they paralleled and how they were different. How difficult was that in the editing room when you had to make, when you, with the transitions and with the quotes and everything, did that become an equally daunting challenge as to editing down the... It, it, it did, and it's a testament. Whenever you hear stories that the director is the sole guiding force behind it, the auteur theory and all that, that is utter nonsense. 
it is a completely collaborative medium, and the editor is at the epicenter. Right. The, the editor is controlling much. So, yeah, it, w it was complex. We went through several editors who grew frustrated with me and uh, my demands, but it, it, it would, the editing is at the center of it. And one, one of the, uh, the issues uh, with uh, the editing, or the challenges of the editing, was that for every time that there was a potential cut of a particular uh, aspect or a particular part of the story, the converse had to be cut as well, because you might recognize in the movie tonight that you know, we, we constantly tried to show the converse of a story. So if there was one element uh, of the story that was being told, it had to be uh, told from the Cooper side as well as from the, uh, the Hemingway side. So that proved to be somewhat of a challenge in the editing process. Yeah, yeah, there, there's so many stories in it that we had a whole section on fashion. I mean, Cooper was uh, Givenchy and Ralph Lauren all said how uh, Bill Blast that Cooper was one of only two men in the 20th century to create a fashion sense and have people follow. And we had a corresponding with Hemingway's, which was anti-fashion. It was, it was fun, but it, it, was, it took up way too much time. We had the same with their politics. Cooper, conservative, Hemingway, liberal. Yet, Cooper voted for Roosevelt twice. He voted for John F. Kennedy, so it wasn't quite as, and Hemingway claimed never to have ever voted in an election. So. Uh, well, and you got some incredibly, I can't, raise your hand, I'll come to you. I don't want to comment during the conversation. Raise your hand if you have a question and I'll come to you. You got some iconic people, of course, to do, to interview. And how was that process? How did you select those people? And were there any that we didn't see up there that you, that you interviewed and we just didn't have time to see in the film? Yes, and in fact, Charlton Heston had already been interviewed by Michael Moore, and I don't know if any of you remember oh, yeah. the documentary. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when we called him, he was very, very cautious, and he said, I want you to submit questions. So we sent him questions, and he called back and said, well, because Coop was my real idol, I will do this, but you have 20 minutes. And so we went out to LA, and we interviewed him, and he was incredibly gracious. I mean, whatever my cold, dead hands, and, and that sort of thing with the guns, whatever that was, the man was just extraordinarily gracious with us. And he gave us an hour and 20 minutes. And we have an awful lot of material from Charles Austin that, of course, doesn't appear. Uh, we, we had a huge section on UAC and uh, what happened, how John Wayne ended up accepting Gary Cooper's award. It's a wonderful story told by Anthony Quinn how that happened, but it, it, it just took up too much time and it wasn't germane really to the point, but it is a funny story. I want to thank you so much for bringing your film to Sedona. It, it was just great and getting to know these icons even better. Thank no, you. no, thank you. Thank you, people. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you here. My question was much like Patrick's. It's about the quotes, though. Where did you get those quotes? Are, were they out there or did you ask for those? Because the quotes were wonderful. The Hemingway quotes? Well, I think the quotes, the quotes by all the different people, such as President Obama. But I think what we were looking for in terms of the film was to be able to, to, to show a paradigm of today's context. Uh, these were, uh, John is, is such a font of, uh, and so well read, of knowledge. Uh, so these are, are quotes that, you know, we, 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 we spoke back and forth about the idea of trying to, in, you know, infuse some current day perspective. And, and, and we, hope, we hope we kind of captured that. Uh, it was researching. I had talked to Daniel Day-Lewis's agent several years ago about 
being a part of a documentary I had done on the political controversy with High Noon, with all the, the nine people that have been blacklisted and that. And his apartment was being renovated in Lower Manhattan. And so he was, <coughs> excuse me, flying to Ireland with his family for a couple of months. It wouldn't be available. But he had said, anything I can ever do about Cooper, please let me know because he's one of my idols. I thought, that's interesting. Daniel Day-Lewis, you wouldn't think that an actor like Daniel Day-Lewis, that Cooper would be on his radar. And we started finding other writers, uh, Tom Hanks, Cooper's his idol, uh, uh, on and on like that. So uh, when we thought we try to place those quotes where it would bring what was happening in 1952 or 1927 up to today. I mean, Liam Neeson has given a great quote on, I don't know if you're familiar with his movie Taken or Taken Two, but he's comparing his hero in Taken to Cooper and Will Kane in High Noon. It's a wonderful, in an interview, and we, we tried to fit it in, but it just didn't work. The, the film uh, deals with the artificiality of political labels. And I was wondering, uh, in the present context, uh, if you were also struck with uh, how two men of different political views could have such a strong friendship and the respect for each other at a time when that seems to be so difficult in Washington. Well, the New York Times critic, and we became a Times critic pick, uh, tweeted uh, about a week after it opened in New York and something had happened in Congress. I had one more mess and he tweeted that why can't Congress learn to get along the way Gary Cooper and Ernest Hemingway did? <laughs> I just want to make a comment. It's a shame that you had to cut so much. It almost like to make this to be a series of overnights to watch it. I would definitely watch it. I really would. Thank you. Thank you very much. When are um, all the other people our age going to be able to see this because it's of so much interest to people of our age. And I don't know if my grandchildren would understand any of it. Well, we were uh, recently approached by uh, Sony uh, Pictures Classic. Uh, we did, uh, as John mentioned, uh, we did receive a critic's pick uh, in the New York Times. Um, I believe that probably uh, we're going to explore the options of a, a, a downloadable version of this, either on uh, iTunes or through Netflix. So, I mean, eventually that's probably where uh, it did premiere uh, in uh, New York uh, theatrically in October, and it did uh, premiere in uh, California in December. <clears throat> um, in line with what a gentleman said up front, what I was thinking is that would be such a shame, those 900 hours that. I mean, you're not, please say you're not going to just leave them on the cutting No, no, what we've done is we've, we've actually, uh, recently we've, we've digitized about uh, 450 hours of the interviews. Uh, I think what struck me, because I, I digitized a lot of them myself, was that uh, in, the, in, the, in the full interviews, you know, I think that uh, the people that we interviewed who knew both uh, Gary Cooper and Ernest Hemingway, um, don't have the opportunity or, or don't, didn't have the opportunity in quite some time to speak about the two of them. And what they had in common is when they started to tell a story, they would all say the same thing. I thought I had forgotten it. I thought I had forgotten it. And they were really, you could tell there was, there was a, a, an excitement and, a, and an eagerness for them to recant the stories that they probably hadn't told in yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. The other, my only thought on that was that, you know, if you can only go so far with the two of them, there must be, there's so much information you have on something Gary Cooper and something Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, we will find ways to, to get that uh, additional media uh, out there in, in, in a format uh, that will probably be specific to the stories that, uh, 
uh, they, uh, the, the personalities have told us. But yeah, you, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, uh, I'll give a shameless plug. Uh, Cooper and Hemingway .com on the net in the next few months. You'll see stuff uh, surface. Fella, there we go. The fella that uh, spoke of uh, Papa in uh, Cuba, what was his relationship? He was the major domo at the Finca. Hemingway met him when he was 10 years old when he bought it. And he started working there at 1939 and stayed on. In fact, Mary in 1972, Mary had been, Jackie Kennedy first, and then Mary had been trying to get him out of Cuba, but the American government kept refusing. So Mary and Jackie Kennedy managed to get him to Spain, where they supported him for two years, and then the government let him come in and he, he's still alive, he lives in New Jersey, right across the river from New York. Mm. Wonderful man, wonderful family. I just wondered what CZ Guest's relationship was to one or the other or both. She and her husband, Winston Guest, were very good friends with both the Coopers and the Hemingways. And in fact, Winston Guest, her husband, once said, which she quoted to me, but I couldn't figure out how to use it, that, uh, not sexually, Ernest Hemingway was in love with Gary Cooper, and the beauty of Gary Cooper is he never knew it. And it, it was a wonderful comment, again, not sexually, but just one man to another, one human being to another. But CZ Guest had wonderful stories about Cooper's womanizing. She could, uh, she, she was around for a lot of that. Uh, his womanizing was... Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty was asked once about his own womanizing, that you are uh, probably the, the biggest womanizer in the history of Hollywood. And he stopped the interview and he said, no, 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 no. After Coop, we're all amateurs. <laughs> Whatever that says about the man. How, how did the two of you become collaborators? How did the two of you begin working on this project? Well, uh, uh, initially I had worked on, uh, John and I had worked on two uh, previous projects for uh, Warner Brothers and Paramount where we did featurettes. Uh, uh, we did uh, Of God and Country uh, that was narrated by Liam Neeson and uh, Inside High Noon that uh, was narrated by uh, um, Frank Langella, but uh, as John had mentioned, there were a number of editors that they had gone through, and, and I, I think I felt John's pain when I saw the kind of the frustrations that he, he was experiencing. And the, the one thing that I believe very strongly in is that it's a producer's job to serve the material. It's not for me to uh, illustrate uh, what my uh, personal feelings are about something. It, it's my job to, uh, to serve that material, and with John, I, 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 he entrusted me, and uh, in the process has become a, a tremendous mentor for me. Don't, don't let him think you didn't let his feelings be known, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and John, I guess this is, is probably more for you. You've been doing this since the 80s, when you kind of started this project, right? Is that what you said? Started around 1980 at Arts and Arts Network, yeah. So for, safe to say, for over three decades, you've been working on this project. What were you doing also at that same, because obviously oh, you had no, to live. other, yeah. I mean, I, I know this was in between things, but what, what were you primarily working on when you weren't doing this? Oh, golly, let's see, done documentaries on Charles Dickens, the late poets, uh, I did Macbeth on Shakespeare, on, uh, Eastern European composers. Uh, uh, I, it, it's not important. You've, you've I, taken you've taken on some just minor little soft things. In other words, <laughs> minor little topics. Any other questions for the gentleman?
They're gonna be around the festival yet the rest of this week. Do you have another question? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, writings that um, Emily didn't finish. That I'm sorry, I missed that. Locked away somewhere. <laughs> Are there any um, stories by Hemingway that oh, were never published there, and that are, you know, his, one might reappear someday? All of his papers are up at the JFK Library in, in Massachusetts and Boston. And yes, there are manuscripts there. Uh, the Garden of Eden, for example, which was published in the mid-80s, less than 300 pages, is 2,000 pages long up there. Uh, and Islands in the Stream, which was published in the 60s, is almost 2,000 pages. Uh, he, he, he was just unable to capture what he, once that plane crash, the, that when he had to batter his way out with his head, it took him a half an hour. He was bleeding from his ears, uh, and he had severe, severe concussions. And he was in, the, in a hospital in uh, Kenya for, in Nairobi for two months after. He was never the same again. But occasionally, uh, you will run across uh, uh, Hemingway transcripts that are, that are found. Uh, in the 70s, they found a steamer trunk uh, at Sloppy Joe's Bar in Key West. And it was filled with manuscripts that he had forgotten that he had left them there, and Mary had located them. So I, I have a, a strong suspicion that probably there are steamer trunks of uh, Hemingway transcripts probably still floating around that have been undiscovered. Could be, could be. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. John, Richard, Cooper Hemingway, the two gems. Thank you all for sticking around.